name is Maria Carmo. I'm from Cardano community. Today, I'm interviewing Alison from Crypto Alley. How are you, Alison? I am fine, thanks. Maria, thank you so much for inviting me to join your channel. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about what I'm working on. Thank you. I, I'm would, excited. Would you tell us a little bit more about when you start in the community and what you have been doing since so we can get to know you a little bit more? Sure. So um, I'm American originally, but I'm living in Switzerland now. And I discovered Cardano uh, when somebody connected me to the Cardano Foundation, which is located in Switzerland. And before the first meeting I had, I started reading about Cardano just to prepare myself. And I was just amazed and excited and inspired. And I just completely um, got hooked on the Cardano vision and, and mission. And so the, the reading and the research and the exploration that I started in preparation for that very first conversation with someone from the Cardano Foundation basically never ended. So I, I became as much a part of the community as, as I could be and uh, researched everything I could and joined the, the online community um, and really have been excited and um, engaged with Cardano ever since then. So that was about just over two years ago now. Um, at, the, at the time, so I've done a lot of different things from a career perspective. But I'm really excited that about six months ago, I was able to quit the job that I had and launch my own business, which is Crypto Alley. And the point of Crypto Alley is to work, it, it's a Cardano entrepreneurial business. And the, the mission is to work on decentralized governance in the Cardano ecosystem, and also the process of decentralized identity, which is what I am really excited about to talk about today. Did you bring any presentations to the subscribers? Yes, I did. I have a presentation um, that talks about the project I'm working on, but I realized that it's easier to explain the project if I give a little bit of background into what decentralized identity, which is also called self-sovereign identity, is. So if you uh, will give me the space, I would love to share my presentation. Okay, so the objective for the presentation, um, where I want to start is what's the problem I'm trying to solve? And the problem is internet identity challenges. And the solution is something called self-sovereign identity. And I'll explain how Cardano fits into that industry. And then finally, my proposal for how I want to use self-sovereign identity in the Cardano community and in Catalyst specifically. So the, the contents will start with a basic definition of identity, go through the other uh, topics that I mentioned and end with questions. But of course, Maria, if you have questions as we go along, feel free to interrupt me and ask. So, before talking about digital identity, I wanted to start with what, what, it, what, what do I mean when I say identity or what does this industry mean? And so basically identity is an identifier plus a credential. So let's unpack both of those terms. So in the real world, long before we even start talking about the internet or the digital identity discussion, identifiers are what makes you, you. So they're locally created in the sense that it's your fingerprint, your face, your name, your signature. Of course, they're locally maintained and they're unique. No one else has the same fingerprint as you. That's what makes it an identifier of you. And in the real world, credentials are issued by lots of different sources and you hold them in your own wallet. So you think about your physical wallet that has your driver's license, your credit card, maybe your gym membership card, your library card, any of those um, credentials that some source has issued to you. So then we come to the problem of digital identity. When we try to take that same combination of an identifier and a credential, but bring it to the online world. And there are a lot of problems with digital identity because when you go online, nobody knows who's on the other side of a transaction. I can't see your face. I mean, obviously we're looking at each other via video now, but it's our machines who are talking to each other. And so the solution is that a user creates an account with a company. I mean, we're using Zoom, so we both logged into our Zoom accounts in order to be able to have this conversation. And your login with the company is a, a login ID and a password. And the company maintains that login and password centrally. 
And whether it's email or video or shopping or banking, the company maintains your account and they own it. And you essentially don't exist online if you don't have an account. So this leads to a lot of problems. I mean, the first one that should be familiar to everyone in this modern world is that you have to remember a huge number of passwords. The average person has to remember 100 passwords now. And that number is increasing. It increased 25% between 2019 and 2020. And that means because people have so many passwords to remember, they use easy to guess passwords and that makes them very easy to steal. Um, another problem is that companies store all of this data about us that they keep in central databases. And if there's one database that has a huge amount of valuable information, that leads to incentives for thieves to try and steal it. So in 2017, Yahoo, the um, internet email and browser company, announced that 3 billion accounts had been hacked, 3 billion. Um, in the US alone, 2021 saw a record 1,862 data compromises, which was a 68% increase. And just in the US, 294 million people had their data compromised. And that average data breach cost $3.86 million per breach. And to help people reduce the number of passwords that they're using, the system has started where you can use a credential from one site, like your Yahoo email address, to log into another site. But then if Yahoo gets breached and somebody gets access to your email address and password, and you've used that email and address and password to log into five other sites, then the thief has all of that data as well. Uh, another problem is the lack of privacy. So companies like, like Facebook and Amazon, they monitor and track our behavior because they have data about our login credentials and how we're using those. And there's little understanding or regulation of what the surveillance looks, looks like. I'm uh, sorry, little understanding or regulation of the surveillance, but everybody knows what it, what it looks like and feels like. If, you're, if you do a search for a product one day, the next day, if you log into something like Facebook, you'll see five ads for related products because they're tracking you in the background. And there's a wonderful book called Uncanny Valley that provides a really chilling view of the power tech platforms have over our data. Um, and then a final problem is that the companies have all the power. So every time you sign up for a new account, you have to agree to these terms and conditions. Nobody reads them, nobody understands them, and we don't really have a choice. And so those agreements are heavily biased in favor of the company. And some of the things that those agreements say is that the companies can decide to, to close your account. They don't have to give you a reason. Um, they don't have to give you warning. They don't have to give you your data. They can just close your account. And if either the company closes your account or if you decide to close your account, if you decide to leave Twitter, you can do that. You can close your account, but then you lose all the data. This comes back to this idea that you don't exist online without an account and that account is provided by some third party, some company. So that's a pretty pretty sad picture. So what, what's the solution to all of these problems that I've just outlined? And the solution is something that's called self-sovereign identity. So I talked about what is an identifier in the real world. It's locally created, locally maintained, decentralized and unique. It's like a fingerprint. So what self-sovereign identity does is create something called a decentralized identifier or a DID. And a DID is like a fingerprint, but it's locally created using your own device and a software program. So you don't need any central party to give you an account. This is, this is an identifier that's decentralized. So it's a decentralized identifier that's created on your own device, probably a phone. So it's then locally maintained, decentralized and unique. It's the equivalent of your, your fingerprint. You don't, no one has to give it to you. It's yours, it's created by you yourself. And then in the real world, we have uh, credentials that are issued by many sources and held in the owner's personal wallet and controlled by the owner. In the self-sovereign identity or SSI world, we have verifiable credentials, VCs, that are issued by many sources and they're held in your electronic wallet, which is a bit like a wallet that you use for holding cryptocurrency. But the difference is the owner is in control and can monitor all of the data sharing that happens with that virtual, that verifiable credential. So coming to the analogy with blockchain, SSI, self-sovereign identity, does for identity 
what blockchain does for money. In the legacy finance world, the bank controlled your account. But what blockchain did, the, re the blockchain revolution, is that it decentralized the control of money and users controlled their own decentralized wallet and really could become their own bank without the need for a bank intermediary. So SSI does the same thing for identity. In the legacy internet world, identity is centrally controlled. But what SSI does is bring decentralized identity that's controlled by the user. So what does that mean? What are, what are the benefits that we'll get from SSI? Well, the first is a reduction in this password chaos. So with SSI, users maintain one seed phrase, like, like the seed phrase that you would have for um, a blockchain account, but this is for your identity wallet. And the seed phrase opens the user's digital wallet and the digital wallet can hold many uh, verifiable credentials, but it can also hold many DIDs all linked to the same seed phrase. So you no longer need a hundred different passwords to log into a hundred different siloed third-party company sites. You use one seed phrase to link to your um, wallet and all of the DIDs that are linked together that you can use to access multiple sites and credentials. So the data is stored locally. I, I keep saying this, it's like having credentials in your physical wallet, but now they're in your own personal um, electronic wallet. And what that means is companies no longer hold large amounts of personal data. So thieves could try to hack into your phone and get your credentials. Of course, there's no um, security that's 100% safe, but they're only gonna get one person's credentials if they manage to log into your, to hack into your phone. They're not gonna get the billions of records that companies are storing. And so one of the huge benefits that this brings is it could reduce the amount that companies spend protecting data records from hacks. And to give just one example, when the Equifax data breach resulted in 147 billion members data getting hacked, that cost the company $1.4 billion to, to deal with that event. Um, another huge benefit to SSI is that it's privacy preserving. So users control how their data is shared. The VCs are stored in the user's wallet and the verifiers can confirm that a VC is valid without even having access to the data. So to give an example, if you go to rent a car in a lot of places, you have to prove that you're over 21 because that's the car rental company's policy. In most places you do this by showing your driver's license, but your driver's license has a whole lot of personal data about you. It has your, your height, your weight, your eye color, your address, your birthday, maybe your, your national identification number. And none of this is information that the rental car company needs. They only need to know that you're over 21. So using SSI and some cryptographic uh, techniques, your digital wallet can, can allow the rental car company to confirm that you're of the right age while hiding the rest of your data. And electronic wallets can log and track every data exchange. So your data is not being shared or used without your, without your consent. You, you can know exactly where your data is going and why. And you can create a separate DID, that's a decentralized identifier for every interaction, which means that companies can't put together um, behavioral patterns and search records of, of what you're doing. You, you regain your privacy. And another benefit of being able to create multiple DIDs all linked to the same seed phrase is that you can maintain peer-to-peer -peer connections and you don't rely on third-party accounts. So we're having this conversation today over the Zoom platform, which is great because it allows us to be connected, but we're still reliant on Zoom. What DID technology does, what SSI technology does is do the same thing for, for communications and connections that blockchain did for the transfer of value. We can connect directly peer to peer without needing a third party intermediary. And that means that neither party provides or controls or owns the relationship with, the, with each other. It's a truly uh, mutual, independent peer to peer connection. And it also means because the user controls their data, they can take it to a new platform um, if they want to. So what does all of this have to do with Cardano? Well, the self-sovereign identity industry um, is, a, is a, an emerging and growing industry. And what, what Cardano, what IO, IOG has done is create their Atala Prism software, which is a way of bringing to life these concepts of self-sovereign identity. So Atala Prism is 
an implementation of these self-sovereign identity techniques. And this future I've, I've um, portrayed, the, the solution to all of the internet identity problems sounds wonderful, but we're a long way, there's a long way between where we are now and that, that vision of what could be. So one of the questions is, is how do we get started? How, how do these techniques start to be used so we can all benefit from the eventual solutions? And so this is where I want to make my contribution, um, particularly to the Cardano and Catalyst community by using the SSI techniques and the Atala Prism technology in the Catalyst process. And so this is my proposal for, for what I would do um, if I receive funding um, in this round, Fund 8. So I'm not sure how much uh, your channel is aware of what Catalyst is, so I thought I would give just a really brief overview. Catalyst is a series of experiments to advance on-chain governance and, and accelerate community-driven innovation in, on, and for the Cardano blockchain ecosystem. And the way it works is that anyone, anyone in the world can request funding from the Cardano treasury for any idea. And then anyone serves as what's called a community advisor or a CA. And the CAs go through all of those funding requests, all of those proposals, and they rate them. And then a group of people called veteran community advisors review every CA's work. Then voters view the proposals and see the CA's ratings. That's the phase we're in now. And research over the past seven funds has shown that CA ratings play a large role in determining funding. So it's there's just very high correlation between proposals that receive high CA ratings and which ones get funded. And then the Cardano Treasury pays the CAs based on the quantity and the quality of the work that they do. So there are a couple of challenges with the CA process. And these are the challenges that I'm, I'm hoping with this project to use SSI to address. So the challenges are that uh, first anonymity. So the CAs are anonymous and that's great for providing impartial feedback, but it also allows for fake profiles and gaming of the system. And then there's a problem of low quality reviews. So in Fund 8, VCAs excluded 36% of assessments. So that's more than a third. Um, and in Fund 7, the number of assessments excluded was even higher, 46%. Um, another challenge is with scalability. So there were a thousand proposals submitted in Fund 7 and 8 approximately, each in each fund requiring at least 3,000 assessments per fund. And that's a minimum. It, that would imply three assessments per proposal. And the actual um, objective is to get five for every proposal. And then there's the issue of CA turnover. There's no metric or incentive for consistent participation. So what would we do to start to solve these problems by using SSI? So the idea is that some kind of educational institution, and I, I use the word institution here very loosely. Um, it, it could be any kind of community educational group that's familiar with the CA process and Cardano and Catalyst. And this group would offer a free virtual course. And the course would describe the very basic CA competencies. So, so what things are critical for a CA to understand in order for them to begin the work of being a CA? Anyone wishing to serve as a CA completes the course. And now here's the part where SSI comes in. The school or the educational institution would issue the CA a verified credential upon course completion. So this would use the Atala Prism technology and the principles of SSI to issue a verifiable credential to the CA when they complete the course. And then when the CA begins the process of writing assessments, which starts when they go into idea scale, they present that verifiable credential to IdeaScale IOG in order to start the process of writing assessments. So in the SSI world, this is what the flow would look like. The educational institution is what's known as the issuer. They issue a VC for the course to the holder, who's the CA. And then the CA presents that credential to the verifier, which is IOG or IdeaScale in order to start the CA process. So what's the point of doing all of this? What, what benefits would this bring? Well, um, it would require each CA to complete an introductory course prior to writing assessments so that they prove their humanity, that they're not a bot. But having a verifiable credential and using decentralized identity allows anonymity to be maintained. Um, the course also serves the, 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 uh, the benefit of 
showing that the CA has the minimum knowledge required for the role and that they've demonstrated some motivation to invest time prior to starting to earn incentives. And importantly, this could lead to increased CA confidence that they have the skills needed to perform the work. One of the things I hear from people who are very new to Catalyst into the community is that they're nervous about starting to be a CA because they're not sure they have the right skills or they know what they need to do. And being a CA can be a great and amazing job opportunity for lots of different people with lots of different backgrounds. And providing an onboarding course could help um, inspire confidence for those people to start the work as a CA while giving them networking opportunities to meet other new CAs. But coming back to the SSI benefits, use having CAs begin to create a digital identity by um, establishing a, a, a DID in an electronic wallet that would hold their verifiable credential, that system could provide the building blocks for a later reputation system. And because the CA would be starting to build up data about themselves and their, their reputation and their work in their own electronic wallet, the data would be stored outside of IdeaScale. So that provides greater security and it leads to less chance for anonymity of anonymity to be compromised, which actually almost happened in Fund 7. I don't know if you remember, but there was a some sort of a glitch and a CA identity was almost uh, compromised and the IOG team had to take emergency action to keep everybody's um, privacy secured. And then the other, the other benefit would be having the CA keep that data in their own wallet would give them the flexibility and the opportunity to use that data for other purposes and on, and on other platforms. And I should say too, this is the, the project that I want to start with because it's controlled and, and limited to the Catalyst environment, but that's just a starting point. There are all kinds of applications throughout the whole Catalyst and Cardano ecosystem that could benefit from, from SSI and from DID. So you could imagine use cases for VCAs, for, for proposers, for voters, um, and all sorts of functionality that, that could be possible in the future. But this proof of concept would be an excellent place to start testing the technology and get the community using it. So the core team for the proposal, um, I'm Allison Fromm with Crypto Alley. Kenrick Nelson was the circle, the Catalyst Circle representative for the CA community. So he's been um, doing some work to liaise with the CA community. And then I was really lucky to get connected to Proofspace. And I should pause here and say that my background is primarily in finance and uh, business development. I'm not a I'm not a coder or a dev. So I I took the Itala Prism course and I learned about the basic concepts and I could follow along when Lars the the teacher who's the director of education for IOG when he did the coding, but I can't write the code to make this all happen. So I was incredibly happy to meet the proof space team, Nick Mason and Victor Redchenko, because they have developed um, tools and infrastructure that allow me to implement SSI technology without having to do the coding myself. So they are funded catalyst proposers. They, they received funding last round to implement all of the Atala Prism technology into their existing dashboard and, and infrastructure. So they are hard at work doing that and should be ready to go um, if this project is funded. So I'll say uh, just an appeal to you and your community to please consider voting for this proposal. I've given the uh, official name of the project, which is Prism Dids for CA onboarding and, and the link to the, to the voter tool. Um, so then I just wanted to conclude by um, refreshing or, or uh, recapping the objectives that I had mentioned to describe the problem of internet identity challenges, describe the solution, which is self-sovereign identity, and talk about my project to begin using SSI in the Catalyst process. And with that, I will stop my presentation. So you want to finance a proposal who will use as a stood case of the use of virtual identity on the CA process of the process of become a CA or a veteran CA on Catalyst, but it yes. doesn't stop there. You can use as a virtual identity for many other applications. Is that correct? That's exactly correct. So my process would start with actually not even veteran community advisors, just the community advisor process and just the community advisor onboarding process. So one very simple project to 
begin using Cardano's Atala Prism technology to create and use uh, decentralized identification and verifiable credentials. I know, I know you showed a little bit of your team, but to build what you want to build, do you need somebody else? You know, it has been very hard to find programmers and developers in the community. Have you considered the risks of hiring people? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's why I was so excited to meet Proofspace because they will do all of the development work. And not just for me, their, their company builds SSI tools that then can be used by projects without having to know how to code. So they're the ones that are responsible for hiring the developers to, to build the backend infrastructure that's needed. And I have asked them a lot about their, their hiring plans. And, and from what I can see, they, they have the right people in place and have incredibly um, qualified and skilled devs and engineers who have put their system together. And theirs is not a new company. So they've been operating for years in this space. What's new for them is that they are new in the Cardano ecosystem. And so it's a good, we have a lot of synergies because I am bringing their technology into Cardano and Catalyst use cases, and they're providing the engineering and the development work and the infrastructure to make the, the projects happen. Did you ask for part of the fund or for the entire fund to have the entire process working? How does it work? Because it's important to know that some people come here and they finance the entire project from Catalyst at the first time in one funding. And some other people come and get chunks of a long process. How does your proposal go about it? Yeah. So first of all, my proposal is only a very small part of the overall challenge budget. So it's in the Accelerate Decentralized Identity Challenge. And this proposal asks for 15% of the budget. So the budget would fund the proof space team to build out all of the components that are needed to get the project working and would support me and, and Kenrick to do the stakeholder management and the project management that's that's needed for the and, and the community education that's needed for the project to get started. But that would only be a proof of concept. And so there will be a lot of follow up work that's needed in the future to um, test the effectiveness of of the of the project to see if it really is improving things or not. And then, as I mentioned, to continue building out the use of SSI for the catalyst workflow that and, and that work will take place over a long time period of months and multiple funds. And so I expect um, we'll, we'll need to keep applying for funding in one way or another. Uh, Alison, thank you very much for coming to the show and present your proposal. I have no more questions. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your taking the time to give me the space to talk about what I'm doing. Thank you. Pleasure to have you. I see you soon. Thank you. Bye.